Now my first job was at a nonprofit environmental group researching in international transportation issues and I, went, I got to travel a lot and in growing uh, Asian cities and Latin American cities I saw some pretty horrific stuff. Thick congestion and increasing health and safety problems coupled, coupled with uh, air pollution problems obviously and, and, and massive investments in road building as the solution. And I wondered how can it be possible that in places where almost no one can afford a car, the only solutions being pushed down their throats by North American governments and European governments with their financing programs are infrastructure and policies and pricing directed solely at motor vehicle ownership and operation. But I also saw and learned about many of the European and Japanese cities that were headed in the right direction, as well as Portland and other cities like Curitiba, Brazil. Cities that were emphasizing bicycling and walking in transit. So I, I saw all this. And at the time, I was involved with a group of people in Washington, D.C. that were pushing the American government for the first time to take a teeny weeny bit of transportation funding and, and, and focus it on bicycling and walking. Like we just said, just a tiny bit, just even think about it. And when we succeeded with our first legislation in the United States that set aside funding for bicycling and walking, I decided that I really wanted to focus my efforts in an American city where I could make a difference, where I could show that we could come back and provide a good model to the world. And so I landed this amazing job, bicycle coordinator in the city of Portland, Oregon. In its early history, Portland's developers and city leaders laid out streetcar tracks to connect residents to housing development. Post, but that didn't last long, unfortunately. Post-World War II, the auto age came to Portland in full force and streetcar tracks were ripped out or paved over and freeways and suburbs were built in all directions. Portland was harmonically in tune with the rest of the country, the rest of North America, heading downhill fast. Neighborhood streets were choking with traffic, house, housing prices were declining, and the number of auto-involved crashes and fatalities were soaring. And by the 1960s, Portland's air was foul and its downtown degraded and declining. Businesses fled to the suburbs. Parents followed suit with Portland's public schools emptying of middle class families. Now, to the east, Portland's, this is Mount Hood, uh, Oregon's most popular destination. So the planners at the time conceived of the Mount Hood Freeway. So this is downtown Portland and Mount Hood is out here. And the, down the, the Mount Hood Freeway was the, da the dash line that would have gone directly through these neighborhoods. Having seen the long-lasting negative impacts of destructive freeway construction, residents had had enough this time and they revolted. They formed a group called Sensible Transportation Options for People Stop. And they teamed up with uh, politicians who were leaders and they fought hard and they won. And the Clinton neighborhood was saved that neighborhood and instead of the Mount Hood Freeway, they took the money and they invested it in our first light rail lines called Max, and they took a downtown parking lot, Pioneer, uh, and turned it into Pioneer Square, which is like Portland's living room. It's really the heart of downtown Portland, and it's, it's pretty fabulous. And to top it off, they took this freeway right next to the river, and they took half of it and turned it into a, a park. And it's really not possible to overstate the impacts of these transformational acts on the culture and economy of Portland. And some of you heard Jan Gell two nights ago, and he probably talked similarly about the, the car-free zones that were placed in uh, Copenhagen. And the, you really can't overstate, right, the transformation, the, the impact of those. And you, you just, you can't. And now in Portland, regional leaders also got into the act, and they formed an urban growth boundary around this black, big black squiggly line. Uh, out outside of which farmland was preserved and development was prohibited in order to contain suburban sprawl. And they drew up plans for expanding Max and encouraging development along Max lines. And another group of forward thinkers developed a concept for a connected system of, of green spaces and trails. And this is all back in the, in the 70s. 
and 80s. And together, leaders and residents researched and they debated and they grew solid in their mutual understanding that land use, the places people live and play and work, go hand in hand with transportation. And I tell you all this because all the things that, that we've done in bicycling are only made possible because of the building blocks of these other things. Because bicycling cannot work just on its own. It has to be part and parcel of a whole suite of solutions. So on the bicycling front, we also started a long time ago, 1971, Oregon passed a bill, which we call the Oregon Bike Bill, the first of its kind in North America. It has two provisions. One, at least 1% 1 of transportation funding in the state of Oregon must be spent on bikeways and walkways. And two, bikeways and walkways must be part of all major road reconstruction and construction. In reaction, Portland pulled together a citizens committee on bicycling and they put in a few bikeway signs and they held a few bikeway events, so there was some early activity going on. And by the early 90s, we had a new champion. We had a commissioner, Earl Blumenauer, he's the guy in the helmet, who was a city councilman. He's now a US congressman and, and is, is known in the US as the, the godfather of livability. And we also had a new advocacy group, the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, which was pushing things forward. The Bicycle Transportation Alliance. But that's what we had. And that's not that much. We had almost no bikeways. This is what our roads look like, almost all of them. And we had almost nobody biking, and we had a very skeptical public. We also had pretty crummy, we had a little bit of bike parking, but it wasn't that useful. And we, we faced similar opposition from the school districts and the campuses of our large universities and hospitals and the police bureau and the fire bureau and the neighborhoods and the business associations. And I, 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 I wrote about this in the book. And the, the media wasn't on our side either and they routinely slammed everything we did. So we had a really, really long way to go. Now let me, I'm gonna read you a little bit from the book um, from one of the early projects. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the location, which is the University of Portland. It's Willamette Boulevard is right on the bluff of the Willamette River. And at the time, I went up there. There had been a lot of requests from cyclists to put in bike lanes on this street. And, I, and so we go up there. We're going to have a public meeting. We're going to discuss it. And to me, it's like a no-brainer. No big deal, right? I'm new to town, so it's no-brainer for me. Um, all we have to do is narrow the existing travel lanes or trade off one of the parking lanes, and the parking lanes don't seem to be a big deal to me because every house has a big driveway. Uh, all these students are trying to go to the university, so no big deal, we'll just put in the bike lanes, right? But the residents didn't see it quite the same. No brainer, not so much. They said, uh, they in fact formed a group called Save Our Boulevard, and they put out all these flyers comparing the city's efforts because we're gonna put in lines and bumps to slow the traffic, and they compared that to the Berlin Wall. <laughs> that's right, that's what it showed, the Berlin, y'all remember the Berlin Wall. <laughs> so you would think I would be a little bit warned at this point that we were in trouble, but I was naive. So this is what we did. I started hauling a bike trailer and a slide projector around the city, speaking to businesses and neighborhood groups, civic organizations, and service clubs. And I would talk about the health impacts of sedentary lifestyles and the increasing problems in air quality and congestion. And I would show examples from our friends in the Netherlands and Denmark and Germany and France, great bikeway cities that I had visited. And I would talk about the need for a comprehensive bikeway system and some of the tools that were in our toolkit, like bike lanes, bicycle boulevards or greenways as you call them, off street paths, good bicycle parking, and education and encouragement and enforcement. Now, most folks thought I was an alien from outer space landed on their planet speaking a language they did not comprehend. And possibly it was because I showed slides like this where it says here that uh, the alien is saying, our first reconnaissance mission to the blue planet indicates that the rectangular creatures in photo one, the cars, are the dominant life forms and feed primarily on the creatures in photo two, the people. 
And at this point, a lot there would be like a big pause, <laughs> and then people would sort of pat their pockets, like checking for their car keys, make sure that they were still there because they were convinced that I was trying to take away their cars. Uh, and then as soon as I was done, they would flee the premises. But at every meeting, at least a few folks would chat, chat with me at the end. Like their doctors had told them to get more exercise. Or they wanted their kids to bike in the neighborhood or at school, like they had once done. And so I figured that if in every group I had 20 or 30 per participants and two or three or four or even five talked to me, that we were actually reaching 10 or 20% of the population that were opening their minds and hearts to bicycling. And if each of those folks started bicycling and their friends saw them getting healthier, healthier and fitter and then their friends started biking well, I was sure that I was on the right track. In 1996, the city of Portland adopted a vision of a complete bikeway network of about 630 miles of bikeways and an official city policy which was to make the bicycle an integral part of daily life. And we declared that the revolution in Portland was underway. So we gathered a team, and I just will say that um, I really hope that you get from this and out of the book that there can, you cannot possibly succeed with just one human in the government. There have to be many people involved, advocates and business leaders and politicians and many staff within city government and all of you, all of the citizens supporting and engaging. We started putting in as many bike lanes as we could. And in most of the projects, we were able to skinny up the travel lanes, just shave a few feet off of each lane and squeeze in bike lanes. And then we moved on to the road diet. Now, in, like that's kind of like Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig, where you, you focus your eating on small but healthy portions of food. And in street lingo, this means you trim the excess fat off of the travel lanes and the parking lanes, or you take, take it a step further and you tighten your belt a few notches and you trade off a travel lane or a parking lane. And then the chub is reallocated to healthy infrastructure like bike lanes or sidewalks or medians or curb extensions or planter strips, you know, healthy infrastructure. Now we call it a balanced meal or a complete street. And one of the first, and so this is just an example, four lanes to three. One of the first one we tackled was a bridge. And I'm going to tell you about this bridge because it's very similar to the Burrard Street Bridge. And at the time, on the Burnside Bridge, similar to the Burrard Bridge up until a year and a half ago, there were two narrow sidewalks and six traffic travel lanes and no space for bicycles. And so your choice was to squeeze on the narrow sidewalk or ride in the travel lane and most people chose door number three, leave the bike at home. So our city traffic engineer Rob Birchfield says, well, it's time to be bold. And with Earl Blumenauer's support, he proposed trading off one travel lane for two bike lanes. So you did it a little differently here where you traded off one travel lane and one side of walking, one pedestrian sidewalk. So it's a little bit different. Yours, your Burrard is longer than Burnside. But this is, was the proposal was to put in uh, three travel lanes in one direction, two in the other direction, and two bike lanes leave the sidewalks as they are. And no one complained. And we learned, and we learned that it's not just the markings, it's the attitude. We've got to invite people to embrace the revolution. We've got to celebrate our successes. And we've got to include marketing and outreach as part of our daily work. And that means that public works departments, who often shy away from thinking that they are in the business of encouraging people to change how they move around. I mean, they think that they're, they're responsible for the signals and the markings and the road quality and whatnot. But, and they go, well, we're not responsible for that whole encouragement thing. That's, we're just not. That's social engineering. Engineering. We can't do that. But what I've learned is the most successful cycling cities embrace that. They say, no, actually, we have spent billions building, putting all this asphalt and concrete all over the city. And it is our responsibility to get as much out of those public dollars as we possibly can. And the very best way to do that is to shift trips to bicycling and walking and transit. And we have to be in the business of encouraging people to take those modes through things like the Ciclovias and the individualized marketing programs like Travel Smart and the Safe Routes to School activities where we're really training another generation of kids. It's a total non-stop focus and an embracing of this as part of the mission well beyond the engineering. But back to the engineering, let me tell you a little bit about another street, Southeast 7th. This is what we did over the weekend. We took the four-lane street and we turned it into a three-lane street with bike lanes. <laughs> now you guys probably are aware that uh, it's a little 
now we had this on an adopted plan, okay? It was in the bike plan, it was in another plan, and, and, uh, and so, but you're probably aware that it's quite different to put something in a plan than to actually go out and stripe it on a weekend, right? So Monday morning comes, and the businesses come, and they go into shock. And you have found, I, we found afterwards,